All right, my friends, we are back on a live stream with Matthew Pose. It's been a long time, my friend. How have you been? I've been good. Uh, had a baby since we last talked, which is why it's been a long time. You had a baby? That's that's an historic feat. I didn't know men can have babies, so maybe you should be in the sequel <laughs> to uh, to Junior with Danny DeVito and Arnold. Which one are you, Arnold or, or Danny DeVito? I plead the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> anyways guys we're back on a live stream it is july 19th it is almost midnight we are i'm a late person i know matt i kind of force you to do these late uh streams with me I'm but a this is a really too. oh that's good this is a really important topic it's speech intelligibility you don't often hear about this too you know talked about online much but it is something that impacts us because quite frankly there are times when I watch movies or I watch TV shows, it's like, man, I can't hear the dialogue good enough, you know? Why can't I hear the center channel voices coming out loud enough? Why isn't it clear enough? And why don't we have a feature from Dolby and from DTS called Center Channel Dialogue Enhance where you can actually boost those levels to hear it better? So we're gonna be talking about all these kind of things. Matt's done a lot of research on this topic. This does get pretty involved, so just prepare, prepare to, uh, to learn some terminology and maybe um, to learn some complex things that might get boring at times. But we'll try to keep this applicable, and we'll try to give tips on how you can improve the sound quality of your home theater, how you can improve center channel intelligibility. That way you hear the dialogue in the movies better. That's really what this application is all about. So, Matt, you put together a PowerPoint presentation. Why don't you bring that up now? We'll share it. and We'll kind of go through all these talking points. And, guys, if you're a patron, I already put this up uh, as a PDF so you could follow along with it. Um, you could look at this after the show if you want. There's just some advantages if you're a patron. I, I encourage you guys to become a patron on our channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. And let us add your PowerPoint to the stream. There we go. Like I like the screenshot there with the Avengers. Yeah, I picked uh, just some current movies that I thought would work well for this uh, title. I mean, this topic, you're saying it's not talked about on the Internet a lot. I On the forums, I think the term intelligibility is not used, but I think that this is probably one of the single biggest complaints people have about their systems. Um, and I think people struggle sometimes to think of the words they would use to describe the problem. You know, they might say something like, well, I can't really understand what they're saying, or I feel like I want to turn it up all the time. But I think when you take the problems that I hear people complain about a lot, and you try to strip it down to what's really going on, speech intelligibility may actually be at the base of many of the problems people face. So that's, I think this is probably one of the most pertinent topics we've done yet, and people just don't realize it. Cool. All right. Well, let's get into it. So yeah, this is, why are all the actors always mumbling? Everything you want to know on clarity and intelligibility. And we're going to try to, uh, as Gene mentioned, I did a bunch of research, in, lit review research, uh, into the topic. It's something that I've been interested in for a while uh, because it is probably uh, the single biggest complaint I get from people who hire me to help them when it comes to, to movie theaters, um, their home movie theaters. And I suspect actually for some of the uh, two-channel sound systems that this is there's a similar complaint it just goes by different names as i said i think people sometimes struggle to figure out the words they want to use so um, speech intelligibility um, is basically the notion that it, it can be sometimes hard to understand dialogue in movies and a common solution is just to turn the volume up we all do it and there's actually a reason why that works uh, it's pretty obvious but it's also pretty important to understand that particular source of the solution because it, it uh, helps us to understand other sources or other solutions. So the source of the problem is often not what you think. Um, I, and I actually learned some things as we went through this that surprised me. So in some cases, it even wasn't what I thought. And I think there's better solutions than the ones we commonly use. I'm going to get into what I think those are, though. So another related uh, concept is clarity. And this is where I think we kind of get into some of the ideas that may uh, relate to uh, music systems as well rather than just uh, the speech in movies. So clarity is the strength of early arriving sound to late arriving sound. Sound Essentially it's when that ratio of early arriving sound, which would be the direct sound plus very early reflections, are much stronger. Now all small domestic rooms always have very high clarity. And so you might argue that small domestic rooms are fine. A counter argument might, mean, might be that even though they're fine, there's still some variation within these small rooms and that um, basically more is better. 
Um, and there are ways of measuring this, and it helps us to, to decipher um, our ability to kind of understand the details of the recording. So when people talk about a system being very resolving, very likely what resolving really means is that the system has very good clarity. So let's see. And, uh, and I'll just add a point, like houses in Florida, for example, um, a lot of them have high ceilings. Some of them have vaulted ceilings, and mostly they have hard floors and glass doors so you're dealing with rooms that are actually very reverberant even though they're small rooms they could still have really bad reflections that kill intelligibility sure and they would affect uh clarity as well yeah those are not ideal acoustic rooms and the um rt times in those rooms tend to be closer to half a second or higher which is really not ideal especially when it's not done in a nice controlled way so now we're going to get into some of this more technical aspects of how we understand speech. So speech intelligibility, which is our ability to recognize and attend to words being spoken, is um, actually more dominated by the phase spectrum information rather than the amplitude uh, spectrum. So what that means is that it's the phase um, of the words being spoken to us that help us to understand what people are saying rather than the frequencies themselves, which was one of the things I sort of understood but not really and the more it came up in the literature i was reading the more i surprised i was because of the implications that has so this means that variation and frequency response is far less important i'm not saying it's not important it very much is but it's not as important as phase variation and it's important to remember that for the most part modifications to the frequency response of speech will affect phase so one of the reasons why those modifications probably impact intelligibility is actually that it's affecting phase as well um, and our ability to understand speech is really dominated by a preservation of the temporal envelope. And when you, again, when you dig into what that really means, that's uh, the change in sound perceived by humans over time. That's what the temporal, temporal envelope is. So preserving that helps us to attend to the words better. And even though we used to think frequency was the dominant uh, part of that, and then later the notion that maybe it was some sort of equal mix between frequency and phase, it actually appears to be that phase spectrum degradation is really what's going on. There was a study that I, I looked into here, and it found that amplitude deg degradation actually wasn't that important at all for speech intelligibility. And the experiments they did where they held one or the other constant, which is what this image comes from, uh, it actually was phase degradation that mattered exclusively. Now, I, I don't, again, the way they did the test doesn't mean that that's true in all conditions. It just means in the way that that test was done, that's true. Well, that's what, interesting because if you look at the research of Harmon on loudspeaker design, everything is about minimizing amplitude problems, right? To get the best amplitude response. Well, and I talked to um, Todd Welty a bit about this, and he commented that certainly if you were to reduce, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, but if you were to reduce the frequency response of a speaker in that two, three kilohertz range, that would affect speech intelligibility. We know that. So that's a spectral thing. Now, it is possible that that's, as I said earlier, that's affecting phase two and that that's what's going on. Um, the other thing to consider is that in most rooms, the, the phase of a source is going to be all screwed up anyway. So mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to I guess make this, this is kind of a new idea to me, so I'm going to be honest in saying I'm still trying to figure out in my head exactly what this means, but I think that it's important to keep these ideas in mind because it tells us a lot about what's going on. It also helps to understand why some of the common solutions people propose that those of us who um, have some professional background in this know don't work, why they don't work. And, and again, I'm going to get into that later. But the, so the conclusion here, though, is that acoustically, it's about preserving and enhancing phase integrity um, for better speech intelligibility. So we'll get into that. It helps to explain a lot of the things that uh, you and I and even James Larson had talked about that I was actually struggling for a while to try to put into scientific terms. All right. So one of the things is Rumi Q Wizard. Uh, has a lot of measures for this. And so I think a lot of people go to that and say, well, you can measure it and we can make sure a room is perfect. Um, I've been trying to use software like RoomyQ Wizard for years to really get a handle on this. And I was really struggling. Um, you know, I, the best way to put it is I couldn't. You just, it was, it was impossible. There really is not a strong correlation to RT 60 times and then the C50, C80, and D50, which are clarity measure times. There wasn't a great um, correlation between those measures and uh, the variations I was hearing in clarity. It was sort of one of those, once you get to a certain point, it looks good in those measures and still isn't good enough. And so that's where the extra measures that are kind of outside what RoomyQ Wizard can do um, 
at least on its own, uh, come into play. So yes, there's lots of cool features built into it for measuring all of these things. The problem is it's just a little bit more complex than these measures, which were really designed around large acoustic spaces. So um, again, while RoomEQ Wizard contains everything you need to evaluate speech intelligibility, there isn't a single measurement uh, within it. In fact, one of the things that you probably really need to be doing are binaural measurements or possibly uh, a uh, multi, there's other multi-mic measurement techniques you could use that would rely on um, uh, ambisonics, for instance, to try to get at the, the 3D acoustics of the room. But basically, absent some method of getting at this sort of 3D acoustics assessment of the room, it's very difficult to really dig into exactly what's going on to cause some of these. So um, what I found out, though, in, in looking into the research was that David Greisinger had actually developed an alternative measure to clarity that he called the limit of localization distance. And it's essentially it's a measure of proximity. It's very interesting. Um, like much of David's work, it's a new idea that hasn't necessarily been adopted by a lot of other folks nor researched by others. He's, just, he's a very smart guy. So it makes it difficult to really understand how this would play out, especially in small rooms. I've reached out to him, but I haven't heard back from him yet, so I can't speak to this. He designed this really as a measure for uh, large, um, like, uh, symphonic halls, and, and that's really his interest. But when you look at some of the research that he was citing when he developed this, you can see that there's actually a correlate to small rooms, and so it probably plays a role. And uh, this LLD measure is really getting at our, it, it deals a lot with that phase integrity idea. And basically what it says is that when the phase integrity or the phase randomness is minimized, we perceive something as more proximal to us closer and it sounds better. And uh, there was experiments done in classrooms, for instance, that also found that students could attend to the teacher's words and they would remember them. They would retain what they heard better. So all this implies that we need to maintain that kind of acoustic environment. And how do you do that? Well, it turns out actually absorbing the vast majority of reflections and minimizing even some early strong reflections helps, which is counter to some of the things we've heard in the past. Yeah, especially the research of Dr. Floyd Toole. Yeah, actually it does. It does go <laughs> against some of the things he said. So another thing we need to keep in mind in understanding speech uh, intelligibility is why we're able... So humans are astoundingly good at deciphering speech in noisy environments. So good that, as David will tell you, there exists no software and no mic systems to date that with the best artificial intelligence or the even supercomputers behind them are capable of pulling out and understanding, attending to speech as well as humans can. And there's arguments for why. One of the arguments is we just don't fully understand how this uh, Haas effect or precedence effect actually works and that if we did, we could probably mimic it better. Um, but uh, for the sake of argument, we'll just say that it is a superhuman, it's not really, but it's, a, it's like a superpower humans have that we can attend to speech uh, very, very well in noisy environments. And the way we can do that um, deals with a bunch of things. So one is that when there's a fairly high ratio of early to late reflections, the brain tends to focus on those um, stronger early reflections. Uh, it, it treats those essentially as direct sound. The strength and volume of the direct sound versus the reflective sound is referred to as the signal-to-noise ratio. The better the signal-to-noise ratio, the easier it is for us to understand people and pay attention. Uh, there appears to be some evidence that the brain is actually able to... So if you have uh, like a white noise or a pink noise or something like that in the background, some sort of random noise going on, and it's loud and it's coming from a similar direction to somebody talking to you, it's fairly hard to understand what that person is saying. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you're talking to somebody and somebody right next to them is also talking, we are able to separate those two out. And so one of the reasons for why that is, um, is that some believe that our brain actually can separate those two into separate streams and essentially filter out one of those streams because they're both speech and the brain is highly adapted to recognizing speech. Uh, and so the direction of sound and the nature of the sound matters quite a bit. Um, you know, then, it's, it's true because in real life, like just to give a practical example, if, if I have the kitchen faucet on and my wife mm -hmm. is in the other room talking to me, I can't always make out her speech really well. Right. Because I hear the faucet, the sound of the faucet is more of a broadband sound, whereas right. opposed if someone else is in the kitchen and they're having a conversation, I could I could still kind of decipher what my wife's saying. I've noticed that myself. 
Right, exactly. And if we think about this, so to bring it back to the practical, because people are probably thinking, well, I don't understand how this applies to me. In your house, your house is filled with white noise sources. So you've got your HVAC system, you've got, mm -hmm. you know, your plumbing and, and water, and you've got fans. And so all of these different types of things are producing white noise. In fact, in my own home theater, I spent a ton of money and a ton of time making it a soundproof room. It is very quiet. The HVAC system is highly isolated, not as isolated as I want it to be, but still, HVAC noises are very, very low. However, I have a very loud projector. It's a standard projector, but the reality is once your noise floor is somewhere between 0 and 10 yep. decibels, a projector producing 25 decibels of sound is very loud. So. Uh, all that money down the drain when I watch a movie, I don't have that low noise anymore. And so that's probably true, though, of a lot of people's theaters. They've got amplifiers of fans in them, projectors, TVs, etc. And all of those things are producing noises that affect our ability to attend to the speech in a movie. So, so a quick tip for you guys, if you have a projector in your room, uh, try to put a hush box around it if it's making noise with the fan or maybe even using an eco mode if you can get it calibrated and get st still get good black level so that fan's not spinning all the time. That makes a big difference. Yeah, anything you can do. And it's, it's important to keep in mind that in general noises that are correlated are additive. And so what that means is that if you've got different fans, if they have a fairly similar spectrum, they're going to be correlated with each other. And your brain will perceive those as additive, meaning that the noise of one mm -hmm. adds on top of the other. So a projector and an amplifier, for instance, that both has a fan, the correlated portion of that is going to add on. And so it gets louder. So even if you've got a very quiet projector and a very quiet amplifier, the two together may not be so quiet anymore. Yep. So another key, guys, to increasing speech intelligibility is to lower the noise floor in your room. It's that probably also the, increases your dynamic range, too. Absolutely. I think it's the single most important thing people should focus on doing, uh, reducing background noise. Basically, it improves signal-to-noise ratio, and that is key. And it's actually the it's probably one of the only things that will work for somebody with hearing loss. So one of the things mm -hmm. that's unfortunate that we've learned is that when you start to have hearing loss problems, the precedence effect just goes out the window. You just lose your ability to attend to the sounds in those ways. And um, you have trouble focusing on what people are saying versus all these other noises, which can be uh, disorienting and uncomfortable. So for those folks who have hearing loss, it's important to keep in mind that your goal has to be reducing background noise. That's the number one thing you can do. And guys, this is, this affects everybody as you get older. I mean, I'm already 46 years old and I can tell you, I don't hear like I used to hear in my twenties. I used to be able to hear the power supplies and TVs all the way out to 20 kilohertz, the flyback converters that's changed. I hear it to about 14 or 15 kilohertz now. And I know when I go to loud parties that I sometimes get overwhelmed with the sound of people talking, whereas I didn't see that 20 years ago. So everybody changes in time. So it's even more important, like Matt is saying, to control your noise sources in your theater room to get the best noise floor, lowest noise floor to, to help compensate for some of the losses that you're getting with age. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to start to break down the issues that affect speech intelligibility uh, more specifically. And there's some things that I, um, James and I have been having conversations about this for, I think, a couple of years actually now. And again, it was, I think the biggest struggle was we were experiencing things that we, we felt we knew to be true, but I was struggling to then apply that to the science. And so I really dug in to try to figure out what is the science behind these ideas. So we're going to look at low-frequency masking, spectral balance, early versus late reflection, signal-to-noise ratio, and the nature of noise, which I've talked about all this a little bit already, but we're going to get into it. So excess reinforcement of bass in the 150 hertz to 500 hertz range can reduce speech intelligibility. So that's normally what people would actually probably call upper bass, lower mid-range, but it's, we're going to call it bass. And it, what it does is it masks. So the mechanism of action that is, is masking low-frequency noise just happens to be in that spectrum, the perfect area to mask the higher frequencies that are dominant in speech. So the key takeaway for this is that elevated sources of low-frequency energy are going to reduce speech intelligibility. And the examples of this that exist in all of our rooms are people who turn their subwoofers up too much because that's going to increase the volume of the LFE channel, which is going to include a lot of things unrelated to the speech, and so that's going to cause a lot of masking. You've got HVAC rumble. That's a very common problem. 
You've got system hum, it, that can also be a problem. And uh, remember that the system hum happens at intervals. It's not just 60 hertz. It's actually 60 hertz, 120 hertz, 240 hertz. It tends to get quieter. Usually the peak is at 120 hertz, but I've seen systems that had a, you know, it was bit, uh, highest level at 120, but it was almost as loud at 240. So you got to be careful. And then um, when you've got really uncorrelated sources, that can be more detrimental than highly correlated sources. And in this case, what I mean, though, is that simply changing the spectral balance, like just turning the bass up on a voice, doesn't mm. really affect our ability to understand the voice. So if all you've done is turned up the bass level of the voice, that's not a problem. It's when it's other things going on that are more like white noise or, or in the case of the LFE channel, explosions and things like that. That's what affects our ability to attend to speech. Now, spectral balance was interesting. I was going into this originally thinking that shifting the spectral balance would certainly affect negatively our ability to attend to speech. And it turns out, for the most part, that's not true. If you uh, change the format value of somebody who's talking, in other words, if I make myself talk at a higher pitch or a lower pitch, you can understand me just as well, for the most part. There is research that says women are easier to understand than men, and part of that they think is because the format value, that's the sort of center frequency of the voice, is higher in women than it is in men. And related to that, what we know is if you turn up in a voice channel, for instance, that area in the 2 to 3 kilohertz range where we're highly sensitive, we tend to be able to understand better. But outside of that, spectral balance doesn't play a big role. So it's interesting that adding a little peak at 2 to 3 kilohertz can improve speech intelligibility, but out, outside of that, really, it's not that important. Interesting. And uh, there's, a, there's a thing we're going to be talking about soon about the 2 to 3 kilohertz range and room correction systems that touch on this. Yeah, well, and related to that, the BBC dip then is something that would lead to speech intelligibility problems. All right, so um, spectral balance of reflections. Now, one of the other things is that part of how you make something not correlated is that you change its phase and you change its spectral balance to that of the primary signal in addition to delaying it. So if all you do is delay the signal, then it's a delayed correlated signal. If you change the nature of that signal in some way, that tends to cause problems. So if you have reflections which are highly correlated with each other, they're just delayed basically, that improves signal to noise ratio, which is what Floyd Tool talks about. And that tends to be true, although there's more specific research that shows that while that's true, actually turning up the direct sound is a much more efficient way of improving signal to noise ratio and improving speech intelligibility. So yes, it works, but it doesn't work as well as other methods. But if those reflections become decorrelated, which happens when, for instance, the uh, wall has a lot of diffusers on it or the wall or the speaker itself has a poor off-axis response that isn't going to help the signal to noise ratio that much and mm. so um, can actually degrade speech intelligibility so uh, it turns out then that adding diffusers to the first reflection points probably is hurting speech intelligibility and clarity um, it also probably uh, hurts i would i would imagine prox uh, the proximity effects and i would also um, suggest that speakers like center channels, MTMs, which you're going to look at, which tend to have a poor horizontal response, part of why sometimes they seem to have really bad speech intelligibility and you see people trying to upgrade their center channels all the time, is that. It's that those reflections off the sidewalls are so bad. In this case, absorbing them properly is probably one of the best ways to deal with that. So here we go. MTMs, MTTMs, MMTTMs, oh no. The orientation of drivers in an MTM dramatically impacts its dispersion and the response of reflection. So in this example here that you see that's a three-way and it's got a vertically oriented tweeter and, and mid-range, the response of this, while not perfect, is really not too bad in the horizontal direction. It gives a nice wide area to the point that the first reflections off of that from that center channel, which happens to be from Monoprice, it's probably mm. good enough to not have an overly negative effect. Now, having said that, the vertical-oriented version of that speaker has a better horizontal response, a much better one. And as a result of that, if you had a choice of the two, the vertically-oriented speaker would be the better one. However, when you get into some of these goofier designs like that other one I'm showing there from Bryston, which is made Jeez. by Axiom Audio, that one has a pretty lousy off-axis response uh, due to the nature of its design, the wide spacing of the tweeters, 
And as a result of that, it may have speech intelligibility problems. Now, I've not actually heard this thing before myself in person, so I don't want to speak to that and say that I know it does. I'm just saying that when you do see these lobing errors and comb filtering, uh, and actually comb filtering is something we're going to talk about more because a lot of people will argue comb filtering is inaudible so it should have no effect. But actually uh, comb filtering can be very important to speech intelligibility. Well, in this case with the Bryson speak, I can tell you that the old days with the Axiom VP150 where it had mm -hmm. the tweeters on opposite ends of the cabinet, the only way that speaker sounded decent was if you sat right on axis to it. If you were equidistant from each tweeter, you're fine. But as soon as when you went over 20 degrees or so, you could totally hear a shift in sound. Well, and here we've got a diagram that shows how that happens. So on the left, we have that monoprice center channel that we were just looking at. And you can see there's clearly a lobing error in the speaker right around 500 hertz or so. You see some holes, essentially, that are showing up there. And right around, probably one of the crossover frequencies, around, um, looks like it's, I don't know, 12, 1200, 1500 hertz, something like that. Um, there's two hot spots, if you will, off axis. But for the most part, you can see a relatively wide red area from, we'll say 500, well, lower than that even, 100 hertz to 10 kilohertz that, that appears to be probably plus or minus about uh, 60 degrees. That's a pretty wide listening window. I would be pretty okay with that. Um, on the other hand, we see this other speaker which is an RSL model that we had looked at, which is a more traditional style of MTM with the tweeter right in the middle. And that one, I'm not picking on it. This speaker is not a bad speaker. That's just what the vertical response, if it was oriented vertically, or the horizontal response, if it's oriented in that center channel style horizontal arrangement, looks like. But what you can see is you've only got about plus or minus 10 degrees, roughly a 20 degree window where the response is consistent. Everything outside of that shows these lobing problems. So this is one of the reasons why center channels can have a negative effect on speech intelligibility and why people sometimes go out spending lots of money on trying different ones to find the right one. What I can tell you is you don't need to spend a lot of money to find the right one. You need to look at the measurements. And if the measurements show a good, consistent horizontal response, it's going to probably have better speech intelligibility. The other thing to consider, too, is how far off axis are you sitting um, from the center channel? Because if you only have one money seat, then this isn't such a big deal. But if you're sitting 20 to 30 degrees off axis, if you have multiple rows of seats, then it's really important to get a center channel that has these kind of characteristics that Matt's talking about. Well, what you're talking about is the effect on tonal balance as you move to the sides, but this is speech intelligibility as it's affected by the reflection. So even if you have a one money seat, those reflections still have a different spectral balance than the on-axis response, and so mm. it's still going to affect speech intelligibility. So in this particular case, that's not true. In this particular case, you actually still want a speaker that has a good horizontal response. So I would argue it doesn't matter if you only have one money seat or not. If you're having issues understanding or attending to the speech in movies, you want a center channel that has a good, even horizontal response. And you still think that's the case if you're absorbing the sidewalls? It's probably less probably true. Probably if less, you're, yeah. yeah, it's probably less true. I mean, one of the things to consider, though, which Tool shows in, in his book and in, in some articles, including one he wrote for Audioholics, is that um, absorbers are not perfect absorbers, especially with fabric on them. If you look at any specific incident angle, what you'll see is that the, ref the frequency response of the reflection is not nice and smooth and flat, nor does it even come close to matching that of the speaker itself. And so what has to happen is you need to absorb enough of it that you just can't hear it anymore or you wouldn't really notice it. So to do that, what that means is probably two inch absorbers are insufficient, which is one of the comments yeah. he makes. You probably need four inch, but it also means you probably don't want overly high density or, you know, I don't know. There's there's foam actually, as much as people make fun of it, happens to be better at this. It's one of the things this is that a good I comment here. I wanted to put up since you're talking about that. I don't know if I can see it because I have my uh, slides up. What's the comment say? Oh, it says the best approach to clear up the 150 to 500 hertz issue is four inch absorption panels with scatter pet plates on both side wall reflection points. Diffusion is good, but only with absorption behind it. Well, probably not. So again, it, I, I, I want to find out more about how significant this is, but scatter plates especially and diffusion in general are still going to be causing phase randomization. So the phase randomization based on there was 
probably a half dozen to a dozen articles I found was the most significant thing that hurt speech intelligibility. So that would imply that that's not a good idea. The absorption, however, would be. So it really maybe isn't a good idea to be putting scatter plates up at these first reflection points. I'm going to say for now, people should take that with a grain of salt till I've had an opportunity to look into it more because I didn't know that going into this. Um, and uh, the research that I found was mostly looking at like hearing aids. And so they were looking at human hearing in general. It wasn't specific to hearing aids, but that was the focus because they were saying hearing aids have themselves a problem of sometimes screwing up the phase and that that would negatively affect speech intelligibility. So it's possible one of the counter arguments could be that with enough reflections in a room in that early reflection period, um, that they would be random phase and that they would mm -hmm. sort of average out. And so the average of these random phase reflections is something that is essentially phase linear. And so if that's true, then maybe it's fine. And then in, in that case, scatter plates would even be a good thing because it would help to improve the number of random reflections. But um, if it's not true, that would make things worse. Okay. Now, what we know for sure, though, is later reflections and reverb are definitely bad for speech intelligibility. The issue is that reverb is really a function of high order reflections over long periods of time. Most small rooms don't have that. Uh, they do have late reflections, but even those late reflections are happening basically towards the tail end of the sort of maximum that a room can have. And you can see that right here in this graph. So if you look at this, uh, I think it's actually an ETC graph, even though it says impulse response. Here's early reflections here in the zero to, technically it's zero to 25 is all early reflections. But the stuff that's kind of definitely considered early reflections and are very strong is in that zero to five range. This is stuff that's happening right off of the first reflection points. And then you can see in this particular room, there's another strong one at about 12 milliseconds, another one at about 22, 23 milliseconds, et cetera. And then as you get out towards 50, it starts to get back into the noise floor. And so those reflections tend to be a lot weaker out that far. And that that's just typically how most domestic rooms look, something kind of like this. This is an untreated room, which you can probably tell. All right, so distraction of strong late reflections. In an article by Parrott and Noble, 1997, they noted that strong lateral reflections cause an almost involuntary turning of the head to face the source in organisms with front-facing vision and directional hearing. So this wasn't just looking at humans, but it is something that's mm -hmm. true of humans. What does that mean? It means if you've got really strong reflections coming off the sidewalls, you're going to look at them, and that tends to be distracting. It also means if you've got somebody sitting next to you and they're talking to you, you're going to look at them, and that tends to be distracting from the speech. Um, and there are other studies that have shown that uh, when we receive similar signals, the spatial effects takes precedent in separating out the filtering of speech. That's what I was talking about earlier. You get these separate streams in the brain, basically, for each of those, where it tries to attend to both of them but it's gonna to go to the strongest one, which may not be the movie. So strong and delayed lateral reflections can be distracting. We probably wanna avoid those. As I said, as can be a person talking to you next to you. So, you know, tell them to shut up. And- So I just wanted to read this. I, re I wanted to read this comment cause it just, it's making me laugh. Um, cigar obsession. It's very tough to tame the background noise in your room when you're married to her. <laughs> I I act, I seriously debated putting that in here or something on those lines. I mean, oh, yes, man. your spouse can be the source, your kids can be the source of those noises, but it, you know, I, I'll say this: if that's your problem, don't go investing in more expensive speakers because there's no solution to that one. Yeah, headphones. Headphones. Yeah. Um, the other thing it's worth mentioning is that lateral reflections in movies are not usually delayed enough to be perceived as all that spatially distinct. What that means is most home theaters are too small for those lateral reflections to be delayed enough to be actually spatially separated out. That's not 100% true. Uh, there's, I need to get into this more, but there's some research that seems to show that reflections as, as small as three milliseconds can be separated out. Um, they still are integrated from a timbre standpoint, but they seem to not be mm. integrated from a spatial standpoint, and not just in terms of apparent source width. It, it just depends on the nature of the sound itself. But one thing to think about is that you can get very strong lateral reflections actually baked into the surround uh, uh, soundtrack itself, so the engineering of it. So they may put stuff in those movies that negatively affect our ability to attend to speech. Right. 
All right, so signal-to-noise ratio, which we talked about before. Early reflections are not helpful to speech because of the reflection itself. It's actually because of the increase in signal-to-noise ratio. We integrate them. Spatially, reflections smear location information. So in other words, that was what I was getting at before. You, you can have actually very, very early reflections, like these ones you see in the 0 to 5 millisecond range, that affect our ability to tell where something is coming from. But from a timbre standpoint, they just improve signal-to-noise ratio. It just makes it louder. So we perceive it as louder, and that improves our ability to uh, understand what's being said. Now, reducing sources of background noise improves, improves speech intelligibility. We've been saying this over and over again. As I, as I said, there's lots of different sources. Your spouse can certainly be one. HVAC noise. Um, now, HVAC noise, depending on its nature, can be less detrimental. So if it's sort of like a whooshing sound, and it's fairly quiet, that might not be as bad as somebody who's sitting right next to you and talking to you, even though I was saying earlier, the precedence effect says you can separate out speech and you have more trouble with background noise. It just, in this case, the issue is one is very quiet and one is very loud. That's, that's why, so signal to noise ratio. Turning, it, turning up the volume, one of the reasons why this obvious solution to turn up the volume works is because you're increasing the signal to noise ratio. But there's lots of reasons why reducing the noise is actually a better option, including for some people, you're already listening pretty loud, so turning it up can actually put you at the point of the limits of your system. It can be dangerous for your hearing. So mm -hmm. it's why we've mentioned before, improving dynamic range by lowering the noise floor is generally a good idea. And as I said, there's research that shows that reflections are a less efficient way to improve signal to noise ratio for speech intelligibility purposes than are just improving direct sound. So that's absorbing. We, we also have to be careful to not tell people to over treat rooms with too much absorption because you don't want to turn a room into an anechoic chamber. I still think there's benefits to having. Yeah. Um, I think it depends on this in the room. Yeah, I think it depends on the kind of room. And to be honest, I think for most people, they're not going to be willing to put enough stuff into the room to really be at risk of that. So you're right. But if it's a home theater system where the surround speakers are dominating all of your spatial cues, getting rid of the room itself is not such a bad idea. Um, it can be not the most comfortable room to be in, which I think is, is kind of more what you're talking about. People don't mm -hmm. always love sitting in anechoic rooms, but it's really hard to turn a room into an anechoic room. So I would, you know, it's expensive. So my guess is that for most people, it's not a huge concern. But yes, don't don't over treat a room. But I would say for movie theaters, for home home movie theaters, uh, getting the RT time down to less than 0.2 seconds, but above 0.1 seconds is actually okay. I'm, I'm, to me, that's a fine target. Um, and I, my room is, is actually around 0.2 seconds. So I think that's pretty reasonable. Mm -hmm. All right, comb filtering. So uh, David Clark is the source of the research that people often cite. It was done in the 80s on comb filtering. And it really showed that room reflections um, fill in the peaks and dips that you see when you measure the steady state response. And so the ear, two ears in the brain, doesn't really perceive what you're seeing with that mic and analyzer. The narrow peaks in general are not all that audible. Um, uh, narrow dips, I should say, are definitely not that audible in the mids and highs. Uh, and so basically that all suggests comb filtering is not a major problem. On the other hand, there is some more recent, re, uh, recent research by uh, folks like Shirley Kenrick and Churchill that found that comb filtering hinders speech intelligibility, which is a different issue than whether you hear the peaks and dips themselves, which is what David was focused on. Mm -hmm. So it appears that early reflections were poorer as supporting speech intelligibility over direct sound, what I was mentioning earlier. And there was this article by, I don't, may mispronounce the name, but Arabi, I believe it was at all, where phase randomization decreased word recognition substantially. And comb filtering would actually cause phase randomization. So that really all kind of combines to suggest that we actually should not be totally ignoring comb filtering, nor should we be designing speakers intentionally which have a significant amount of comb filtering. Right. All right, so what can I do to better my system? So reducing all sources of background noise, I think, is probably one of the most important things people can do, and I would focus the most on low-frequency noise, uh, including, you know, telling other people to be quiet during the mooding. If you have hearing difficulties, you know, if you've had some hearing loss or you're older, I definitely think that that's an important consideration that other folks in the room with you should understand because there are very few other things you can do that are going to improve your ability to understand what's happening in the movie. 
And so they just have to be kind of accepting that your ability to perceive speech in a movie is different from theirs because of the difference in hearing. And men tend to have more hearing loss than women as they get older. Um, adding absorption is a good idea. Reducing the RT60 time of rooms to below half a second, I think, is critical. I really don't think that any uh, domestic room should have a RT60 time above half a second unless it's a very, very large room and it's primarily used for music. So I, again, maybe one thing you could do as a follow-up to this video is, is do a tutorial on how someone can measure their RT60 time in the room so they could sure. see if they meet that goal. Sure. And I will mention this. There's a lot of argument because the formulas and the theories around RT60 were designed around concepts that included a reverberant field. And as I mentioned before, small domestic rooms don't have a reverberant field. Um, the, essentially what happens is the sound drops below that. It drops by more than 60 decibels long before a reverberant field would ever be formed. So you can argue there is a reverberant field, but it is so quiet that it doesn't really count. However, it's important to keep in mind that RT60, the measurement, is simply measuring after a certain period of time how long it takes for sound to drop by 60 decibels, meaning that in Room EQ Wizard, that is a factually accurate measurement of the decay time of the room. So, for those of you who get really hung up on that, RT60, the theory, doesn't really apply to small rooms. The calculations doesn't apply to small rooms. The measurement does. It's perfectly fine. Base decay is probably very critical to speech intelligibility because having higher amounts of bass over longer periods of time are going to cause that masking effect I mentioned. Mm -hmm. I will say RT60 is not a great measure of base decay because the modes affect things dramatically there. However, if you have a very smooth response, if it's EQ'd properly, then you can compare uh, differences in base decay. Uh, over time and the best one to use is not the standard RT60 but the RT60 model that's been recently added to Room EQ Wizard. That one is accurate down to 50 hertz and below kind of thing. Um, modal ringing which I just mentioned is a problem so EQ multiple subwoofers and even bass traps are a good way to do that and this is one of those situations you know you want bass to ring it should ring. The room itself it should not you produce the sound and then immediately stop. You don't want that kind of a thing. You do want ringing that's normal. What you don't though want is really extended ringing over excessive amounts of time. And so that's where getting into adding bass traps is important. And then the other thing is that a really rough bass response is probably going to cause more of these masking problems. And so EQ and multiple subwoofers tends to help with that. Yeah, and if you get the amplitude response right at bass frequencies, you're fixing the ringing problem. You're fixing all these other problems that you're talking about. Right, exactly. Um, now, we're going to actually do a whole video just like this on that later, and uh, hopefully it'll be informative. Uh, I think it's important to make sure the subwoofers and surrounds are properly balanced. So I know a lot of people like to, the, it's like they, they set up their system, they run the automatic uh, speaker setup algorithm that's built into their receiver, it gets everything balanced correctly, then they go in, they turn the subwoofer up 6 decibels, they turn up the center channel 6 decibels, and they turn up the surround 6 decibels. Now, the, turning up the center channel probably improves uh, speech clarity, speech, uh, your mm -hmm. ability to, to attend to what people are saying. You're probably doing that, though, because you turned up the surrounds, which reduced your ability to understand speech, and you turned up the subwoofer, which reduced the ability to understand speech. So it may make more sense. I get it. Some people are bass heads. I am as well. And we like our subwoofers turned up. But at the end of the day, it may make more sense to make sure everything is balanced out if you're having trouble attending to speech in movies. Well, and then to that effect, I personally, when I set up my theater, um, I tend to boost the sub a couple of dB only because I've flattened the response. So if you don't have a flat response and you have high Q peaks, then cranking up that sub lef subwoofer level is definitely going to mess up your speech intelligibility. It's just not going to sound very cohesive. But... Um, I do tend to turn the center channel up about 2 dB sometimes because um, I know the way things are mixed these days, and especially like concert Blu-rays. I have a Porcupine Tree concert Blu-ray, and they did not mix the center channel right. And I actually talked to the producer, the singer, Steve Wilson, and he said that was unfortunate of how they mic'd it. They couldn't avoid it. So there are cases where you do have to crank that center channel up a few dB depending on the source material. Yeah, I mean, people should do what works for them. Um, I'm just kind of laying it out there. I, I think constantly boosting the center channel, one of the things to consider is why are you doing that? As I said, I think the primary reason why people do that is that they're doing other things that are counterproductive to um, their ability to attend to speech. So, mm -hmm. okay, the other thing is that, it, again, 
it's not going to sound good. This is not how do you make it sound good. This is how do you make it so that you have better speech clarity. Re-equalizing the center channel, or really probably the front three speakers, to have a modest two or three decibel boost in the two to three kilohertz range with a Q of about, you know, somewhere between one, one and a half, maybe two, is a good way to improve your ability to attend to speech. But like I said, it's not going to sound that great, especially with music. You're going to notice it. However, as many of us know, for some odd reason, Odyssey actually builds this into their equalization because they think that it improves things. Why? Because they have this argument that when you do that right at the crossover point where speakers tend to have a narrowing and dispersion due to poor, um, basically, tweeter to woofer uh, integration, that it, it reduces the um, brightness that people perceive when a system is EQ'd flat. What they're really doing is correcting for a bad speaker and so hopefully you don't own a bad speaker. And if you do, buy a better speaker because that's a better fix than what they did. Yeah, well, I wanted to interject something here because somebody in the past said a comment about they use the dialog lift in the Yamaha uh, receiver, the 3080. I actually measured what that does, and it actually does exactly what you're saying. It, it gives you a boost in the mid frequencies. And it can sound good for movies. And it, and like you said, when I put that on for music, I couldn't figure out why things sounded weird and I forgot to turn it off. Mm -hmm. And then when I realized what was going on, turning off the dialogue lift made a difference for listening to uh, multi-channel music. Now, with Odyssey, I agree with you. That center channel dip that they put in is or the, yeah, the, the two kilohertz dip that they put in across the board is not a good idea, in my opinion. In fact, Nine times out of ten when I run Odyssey, I never use the Odyssey curve. I always use the flat curve. The flat yeah. curve, I think, bypasses that two kilohertz dip. I, I wish they would take that out. I mean, if you have the editor app for Denon and you go and calibrate your system, you could deselect that two kilohertz dip. But by default, I believe it's still turned on. I'm pretty sure you're right, and I'll tell you, whenever I have a client who hires me to help them with their system and we get into opera, uh, you know, basically running these optimizations and they're using Odyssey, uh, the first thing I do if they have a new enough receiver is I have them go and buy that app. I think it's like $20, and mm -hmm. uh, we do it for two reasons. One is to make sure that they're using a proper target curve shape that properly follows both the natural response of their speaker and the general curve that you want to see in a room, and also to turn that off. And I've had a number of customers where I feel bad taking their money because that was the number one thing that actually improved their system. Everything else we did was almost for nothing. Mm. Uh, that alone ended up being worth it. And it's like, hey, if you had known better, 20 bucks would have fixed your problem. Yeah, or Not just turn the true, but... system off completely. Well, I, yes, that often is the case. All right, so then uh, turning the volume up helps, again, improves signal-to-noise ratio. And then using things like compressors, which the night mode that you would have, or the dynamic range compression, sometimes they just call it that. Ten, so again, it all is different ways of improving signal-to-noise ratio. So when you're putting on night mode, what it's typically doing is bringing up the really quiet speech in movies so that the overall dynamic range is shrunk quite a bit, but it then means that the majority of speech is playing back at a level that is high relative to the noise in the room. So, you know, if you're having trouble understanding speech, that's a good mode to turn on. Mm -hmm. I use it actually in my, so in our TV system upstairs in the living room where I could care less whether it, you know, is THX reference levels and all of that, um, I use it almost constantly in night mode. Um, I don't really, you know, my wife doesn't love it when the subwoofers are like shaking the house up there. So it actually quiets the subs down, but it makes speech easier to hear over kids yelling and a new baby crying. Hmm. All right. So what doesn't work? There's your two to three kilohertz dip that Odyssey likes to throw in. Um, so buying new speakers, it's not that it doesn't work. As I said earlier, it can work. It's just that I don't, I hate to see people constantly going and just kind of like an upgrade ice. They're just buying, buying, buying. Look at our reviews. Look at our measurements. Focus on a speaker that has a good, consistent off-axis response. And if it does, the speaker should be fine. If you have a speaker that happens to have a bad off-axis response or it's a bad MTM, yes, probably upgrading to a better center channel would be good. But I have also seen people do it sort of blindly. They just they buy the next hot thing or like the next model up, and that maybe isn't a good idea. You want to focus on the measurements. But the other thing is... Maybe try all the free stuff first, or the cheap stuff. So killing early reflections is debatable because it improves signal-to-noise ratio, as I mentioned earlier. But there is some research. Uh, David Greisinger's got a whole bunch of stuff on, on some articles and presentations he's done that really suggests that maybe our concepts around why that's good for speech isn't so right on. 
And there's other researchers behind him that kind of support this idea. So I would say at least try it. It doesn't hurt. In my own opinion, based on my experience, I do actually think killing early reflections improves speech intelligibility. And so for uh, home theaters, I almost always uh, absorb the first reflection points for that. And I will say there is no debate. Nobody's arguing this point. Killing mid and late reflections does improve intelligibility. We, it's definitely something you should be focusing on. Now, adding diffusers, somebody had mentioned earlier, I, I don't think it's a good idea based on everything I've read, but nobody ever did an article that said if you put a diffuser at a first you know, reflection point, what does it do to speech intelligibility? However, they did do some research that used binaural headphone uh tests basically where they took what would be a, the equivalent of early reflections and randomized the few uh, uh, the phase which is what a diffuser does and that dramatically worsened speech intelligibility so that implies to me that probably it's not a good idea to add diffusers um, at early reflection points room correction other than smoothing out the base which we mentioned earlier helps to uh, improve things with regard to the base's ability to kind of cover up our, our recognition of speech, room correction systems aren't going to improve speech intelligibility. So, you know, I wouldn't look at that as some sort of magic fix. Um, your spouse or kids explaining the movie to you. So my wife speaks Russian. She's from Russia. And uh, we, we watch uh, English movies together, but we sometimes will watch Russian shows or movies, and she needs to explain it to me. Now, I don't speak enough Russian for me to understand what's going on in Russian anyway, so it's not really an issue. But I sometimes try to understand because I'm trying to learn more Russian, and um, it's really hard when she's talking to me in English to, uh, to then understand what's happening in Russian, and she has the opposite problem. If she's watching a movie in English and somebody starts talking to her in Russian, she can't understand it anymore, and generally the same is true even when it's in the same language. When somebody starts talking to you about something, even if it's related but it's not what's going on, it doesn't help you. So, you know, if you're having trouble hearing it and you say, what did he say? And then, you know, your wife next to you says, ah, blah, 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 blah. You're actually probably making it that much harder for you. You'd be better off pausing the movie. Yep, absolutely. You have to pause. Yep. Uh, or if up... they laugh too much, you know, you're watching like a Seinfeld episode and people are laughing. Like, that just kind of throws me too sometimes. Yeah. Now, turning up the center channel, it does work. I'm saying here it doesn't work. It does work. It's just it's no different than raising the volume. But it, it, it causes an imbalance across the front. And so in my opinion, and remember, speech comes from more than just the center channel, especially in a properly done movie. So because of that, in my opinion, it makes more sense to fix everything else rather than just turning the center channel up. A dB or two like you do, Gene, I think is fine. But I've seen some people who do it more like six to nine excuse me, six to nine dBs. I know actually an older gentleman, well, he's got his turned up all the way, which I think is 12 dBs on his receiver. And here's a good point from one of our readers, line of sight, basically. You want to make sure that the center channel, um, the tweeter is not being blocked in the first or the second row. You know, get that center channel high up enough, preferably uh, behind an acoustically transparent screen. Then you can have all your speakers vertically mounted. I mean, that kind of stuff really makes a difference. And I'm still waiting. Again, I'm waiting for that feature for Do uh, Dolby Atmos and for DTSX to give us that center channel um, dialogue enhance, where it just raises the dialogue without raising the volume of the center channel. When are we going to get that? Well, you know, we did that before. Dolby, there's so much promise in Dolby Atmos that hasn't been realized yet. And I wish I could answer it because I don't know what they're doing. I don't know what the problems are. There may be very practical limitations we don't understand, but there's absolutely no reason why voices can't be essentially independent, manipulable objects. objects. Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. so there's no reason why they can't be turned up or have the frequency response changed. So lots of products right now do have these speech lift type features. I have no idea. I mean, maybe there is separate voice objects in there that it's able to manipulate, and I don't know about it. But the ones that I've used don't appear to be doing anything more than what we said earlier. It raises the 2 to 3 kilohertz range and tends to turn up the center channel. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think they're doing anything all that special, which is difficult when you've got movies that actually have a lot of speech going on across the entire front and, you know, um, there are cases There are cases with bad mixes. Disney's had a lot of bad mixes that have had speech intelligibility problems. You remember when the Batman trilogy came out and the last one with Bane? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, speech Dark, was different. Dark Knight Rises? Yeah, when that was in the movie theater, you couldn't even understand half the stuff he was saying, Bane, because of the mask. They actually remixed that for the Blu-ray release, and it was easier to understand. Because I remember when I went to the theater, I couldn't understand anything he was saying. 
And then yeah. when I got it home on Blu-ray, it was a lot, it was actually improved. So they went and they fixed that. Well, and on this slide, I've got uh, Christopher Nolan's Interstellar, which was uh, extremely famous for having lousy speech intelligibility. Now, he argued it was on purpose. Hmm. Fine, but it made it hard sometimes <laughs> to know what was going on. Um, and I've, I've heard explanations of it. Essentially, what the explanation is, is everything I was telling you guys before with regard to things like low-frequency masking. In real life, if you were going through a chaotic thing like was happening in that movie with rockets you know burning behind you and explosions and crashing and all that you would have trouble hearing people talking to you or hearing noises that that's real life and they wanted that to be true so they intentionally mixed it in a way that was more consistent with how it would be in real life rather than doing it in a way that would improve speech intelligibility which is actually how most movies are done they, they usually do try to make it so that there's a focus on speech yeah and what that means is that that movie was exceedingly difficult to attend to all the speech in the movie. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. I mean, as I said, there's some research that shows that when you can't attend a speech, you don't pay attention and you forget what you're, you know, later on, you'll forget what you saw. So it's totally possible that people didn't pay as close attention to the movie as they should have because of that and probably didn't remember key things. So, um, you know, in terms of what did Christopher Nolan do? Well, there was very high effect volume levels relative to speech. There was a significant amount of low frequency masking. Um, the other thing he did, which is not real life, I don't know about you guys, but I don't have music that follows me around all the time in the background. Um, hmm. But they turned up the background music in that to be pretty loud, which made it ha hard to hear voices when the music was playing. Um, and then there was a strong intentional encoding of phase decorrelation in speech, uh, like heavy reverberation at times. Again, to make it seem more real, but it does make it hard to hear. The point here is that probably as much as your room and equipment are the problem, the movie is probably equal or worse uh, to causing issues with speech intelligibility. Yeah. All right, so I mentioned that there was a bunch of newer research that I was looking at, stuff that came out, let's say, sometime between 2015 and, and today, uh, including a bunch of stuff that I had gotten from David that just seems to suggest that some of our old ideas are maybe not right, but I don't feel like I understand them all well enough yet to tell everybody they need to you know, completely change their understanding exclusively. I think that the phase randomization issue is been studied in enough different research studies using experimental designs that it's it's probably true what i think is not as well understood is you know is it okay to diffuse early reflections or not again based on what i saw i don't think so but that it's possible that again they're kind of averaging out and what you're hearing is more phase linear than than what you might expect um I think strong early reflections in small rooms reduce clarity and attention. They, that seems to be something. And some of our focus on how it improves apparent source width, David's challenging those ideas in some of his work right now and uh, cites some articles that, that suggest that that maybe isn't a good thing. I will say this, I, as much as I understand why that's a good thing and I've even promoted it in past videos, my personal preference has always been for rooms that had weak lateral reflections. My favorite speakers are directivity controlled designs, which themselves naturally have weaker lateral reflections. And I tend to prefer putting first reflection absorbers in, in many of the systems that I design for myself. So even though I get that it's less realistic to being in an actual music hall, uh, it, it's, prefer, it's just what I prefer the sound of. And David's saying that actually when you make music halls mimic that kind of behavior, people prefer those too. <laughs> And so it seems to suggest that our focus on strong early reflections being a good thing is not really true and that we can improve signal to noise ratio in other better ways, like actually improving the volume of the direct sound. I would love to get Dr. Floyd tools opinion on this conversation we're having, because it just seems like it's, it's not in line with what he's been saying in his books for so long about early reflections, actually increasing speech intelligibility. And I don't think he was talking about, two-channel versus multi-channel i thought he was pretty broad about it for all cases well again it goes back to the notion of improving the signal to noise ratio early reflections which are highly correlated improve uh signal to noise ratio there's just no debating that and that will improve uh speech intelligibility the problem comes in what if those early reflections are not so well correlated like with speakers that have a poor off-axis response or where yeah, things so, on the walls right. are causing other forms of phase randomization and then the other argument, 
is that really better than just getting rid of those reflections and turning the system up, which also improves signal to noise ratio? So it, it almost implies if you have if you have a really good speaker that has very uniform dispersion, like a Revel, for example, then the sidewall absorbing the sidewalls isn't so important because you're preserving early reflections and you're matching them and and they're correlating and they're giving you better speech intelligibility. But if you have a bad speaker, then just absorb the sidewalls and maybe you're going to be as good as the good speaker without the absorption on the sidewalls. Maybe, yes. And I think in those cases too, you need to make sure it's a good absorber. Uh, and I'll say this, I think personally, based on the, the stuff that I've seen with how absorbers absorb sound at different angles, the way that we measure absorbers is a fine general test. I think it should not be the only test we use. I think that we need to start looking at the, I think we need to start using a different approach that doesn't use um, in a, a uh, like a basically an echo room um, with a bunch of microphones around the panel mm -hmm. in a pink noise source. I think what it needs to be instead is they should be starting to do polar plots basically of the absorption response of these panels in addition to the incident absorption uh, response of these. And the reason for that is that the a the incident absorption response is essentially the average across all of the angles, which is very flat. It's no different than doing like a, a moving mic average. If you take a microphone and you average enough area over a large enough space over enough time, you get a much flatter response than you may actually perceive, for instance, in a specific location. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true of these absorbers. So the problem with that is that the absorber is in a fixed location relative to the speaker and the listener, meaning you're always perceiving a reflection off of that absorber that has the response of that one angle. So if that one angle has a very poor response, then what you've done is taken, no matter how good the speaker is, and created a very poor reflection. So as I said, if it actually absorbs it sufficiently that you can't hear that reflection anymore, then it probably doesn't matter. But the issue becomes how much does it need to absorb? How much does that sound need to come down to not be audible? Because even four inch absorbers are only reducing it somewhere between 10 and 15 decibels. And that's not really that much. I don't know that that's sufficient to be inaudible. Hmm. But all right, we've kind of digressed a little bit with that one. So as I already mentioned, subjectively, I and others have felt that early reflections might not be so good. Uh, Earl Geddes is another person who supports the idea of um, reducing the strength of them. And he believes, I mean, I took this from him, so I'm not going to take any credit for it. He, his belief is that in general, absorbers are not the best way to do this, that it's better to design it into the speaker. And it goes back to what I just was saying. Absorbers just don't tend to be great at absorbing evenly at uh, these different angles. And so... You know, it doesn't mean there shouldn't be absorption in the room. There should be, but it probably makes sense at early reflection points to rely more on a speaker that has narrower dispersion if you're trying to do this. To the point of speech intelligibility, it does mean that speakers that have good um, directivity control probably have better intelligibility. And we did a whole presentation on this um, a couple of months ago. And, you know, you yeah. guys, I'll link it up uh, below if you guys want to see narrow versus wide dispersion speakers. Right. And even though, as I said, in general, there's a view that having more lateral reflections tends to be more natural to what we would hear in a performance space. I, I do listen to music like that. I tend to listen to a lot more studio music, which has nothing to do with that. And so my preference is also for these drier rooms with early reflections reduced. Now, in terms of, again, this is kind of new research ideas of the notion of phase degradation affecting speech in small rooms. I think one of the big problems is that there, it's just not clear to me what are the common sources of phase degradation in small rooms. There isn't any research on that particular topic. And um, so I think it's something that we kind of need answers to to help us understand how to adjust the way we design home theaters to improve speech intelligibility. So I wanted to give you guys these ideas because I think they're interesting and important and they're worth considering when you're trying to fix problems. But at the same time, as I said, maybe take some of them with a grain of salt just because we need to learn more before we can really uh, commit to these ideas.
Okay, so what I'd like to do now is just kind of give a, a three minute recap because I'm going to break this up into a short video and republish it. So people that don't want to spend an hour watching this get the bottom line of what we spoke about today. The topic of today was about um, understanding speech intelligibility, how to improve speech intelligibility for your home theater, for music and for movies. And we came up with a couple of different methodologies that would help that. Uh, number one would be to lower the noise floor of your room. That means get rid of the background noise, get rid of the HVAC noise, get rid of, you know, people, babies crying, people, cry, you know, talking, lower the noise floor. Um, when you're designing a room to do noise isolation for that room, in fact, I'm doing that in the AudioHawk Smart Home and I have a couple of videos on that to just get that noise floor lower down because when you get that noise floor lower down, you increase your dynamic range, you increase your signal to noise ratio. There's just a lot of benefits, especially for people that are hard at hearing. Um, lowering the noise for the room is going to allow them to understand the sounds, hear the sounds better. That's number one. Um, number two, I would say choose good speakers. Don't choose crappy speakers. We we do tons of reviews, tons of measurements on speakers. You can look at the responses to see what's going on, especially when you're choosing a center channel. Don't choose one of these wonky designs that have tweeters firing on opposite ends of the cabinet. Choose a good WTMW. Or if you're going to use an MTM, make sure you have a very narrow um, seating area that you're not sitting too far off axis. And then I guess the other thing to do, and also make sure your speakers are line of sight. Your, especially your LCR speakers need to be line of sight, meaning that that tweeter should be firing at your listening area, not being obstructed by any surfaces nearby or any direct paths blocking it. You know, if you have a multi-row seat, make sure that the, the center channel is high up enough. That way the tweeter hits that second row without being blocked by the first row or the people sitting in the first row. That makes a real big difference. The other thing too, as Matt was talking about, is to control your early reflections, control your, you know, get some absorption up on the walls if you have a very reverberant room. And Matt's a big fan of narrow dispersion speakers. I'm kind of a fan of wide dispersion speakers. I think we've had this debate in other videos that we don't need to go out in here, <laughs> but, um, you know, I guess in terms of speech intelligibility, it probably does make sense to have more narrow dispersion speakers, horn kind of waveguide kind of speakers. That really makes a difference. And then the other thing, too, is is the source material. Source material, it matters significantly about speech intelligibility because and this is not something you have uh, always have control over. There are movies that are just poorly mixed. And in those cases, your only solution might be to lower the bass levels a little bit, increase the center channel volume up a little bit, and you know, just kind of deal with that. You're dealing with a limitation of the software. And until we get um, software that's smarter, until we get the features that Dolby Atmos and DTS-X were promising about the center channel uh, lift, where they were gonna increase the objects of the center or the dialogue so you could hear that better, I don't think we have any definitive solution to increase speech intelligibility from the software's perspective until these encoders are actually implementing these features or the software is implementing the features that the encoders are supposed to do. So I don't know, did I leave anything off, Matt, of, of methods of increasing speech intelligibility that we just basically talked about in the last hour? I think you covered most of them. I think just to add to that last one, I think what we were saying was that from a software DSP standpoint, uh, you know, a modest boost at two to three kilohertz is probably as good as you can do. Right, right. All right. And then, guys, if you're doing room correction, um, the other thing you might want to consider is is if you're having a problem with speech intelligibility, turn off the room correction. And at the very minimum, if you're using something like Odyssey, where it puts that two kilohertz notch in the Odyssey response, disable that before you run the Odyssey curve. In fact, if you're running Odyssey, I would probably recommend you use the flat curve. Then you know that that two kilohertz notch will be removed. I also don't recommend doing full bandwidth correction on many of these systems. I would I would maybe limit that correction to a couple of hundred hertz, maybe even a one kilohertz, and then see how you like the sound there. And, you know, just get your channels balanced out. You know, a lot of times people set up their home theaters and they have their surrounds firing way too loud, like Matt was saying. If you're sitting close to a speaker, you're going to localize that speaker even more, especially if it's louder than the other ones. And that's going to kill your speech intelligibility right there. I think that's good. Is there any comments we want to cover in the live comments or do you think we've covered it all? 
I thought we got um, someone said here. I thought speech was around 500 hertz. Actually, I, I in my telecom days, everything we did for speech for telephony with voice over pots and DSL was from 200 hertz to four kilohertz. That was a critical band for speech intelligibility in all of our tests. And Bell Labs did the same thing. So I would say speech intelligibility starts as low as 200 hertz. Do you agree with that, Matt? Exactly, yeah. So it starts pretty low. Um, <clears throat> and then what happens is that there's sort of a center uh, frequency in your voice naturally. And men obviously tend to have a lower center frequency in their voice than mm -hmm. women. But there's a peak, if you will, in our perception of speech that happens to be between two and three kilohertz um i'd have to look it up i don't remember where men's versus women's were on average on that but i think it was i think men's were pretty low i think it might have been actually near like 500 hertz so someone here is asking does room height uh, cause issues like higher ceilings create more issues with dialogue and i think a lot of that depends on if it's a flat ceiling versus a, a vaulted ceiling that's really tall those are terrible. I had, I've been in houses. I had my first house where it had a big vaulted ceiling that probably went up 25, 30 feet. And let me tell you, until I put some absorption in that room, it just killed uh, clarity and it just killed the fidelity of my system. Well, and I, so here's the issue in case you're wondering why big ceilings make a difference. It's any big dimension makes a difference. When you increase the overall volume of the room, it makes the room sound basically more echoey or more reverberant so even though it doesn't actually have a true reverberant field and uh it, it can still have echoes in it and it can still become more reverberant so what happens is the energy decay becomes longer the bigger the room is so raising the height of the ceilings increases volume so when it's got odd shapes like you're talking about in the case of vaulted ceilings that creates other issues because of the way sound is reflected back but in general Higher ceilings makes the room bigger. Making the room bigger makes it have longer decay times, and that affects negatively speech intelligibility. And I'm not talking bad about having high ceilings. In fact, my current theater room has an eight-foot ceiling. I'm going. My new theater room is going to have a ten-foot, which I welcome, because now I can put more space between the Atmos layer and the bed channels, which is going to give me that envelope of sound, the bubble of sound that you always hear about, much better than it would if your speakers are too close together. So I do think it's important to have tall ceilings, but you just have to control the reflections of the room. Yeah. Well, the commercial other cinemas, thing was, yeah, you think about commercial cinemas have, what, 25, 30 foot ceilings, something like that. They're really tall. Uh, they sound fine. And I mean, some of them don't, but for the most part, no. they sound fine. And they can be made to sound fine. There's also large studios that have 20, 30 foot ceilings that sound fine. It's all about how you deal with it. So if you have tall ceilings, you can make the room sound good. You just have to make sure you deal with the issues. Right. So this is another important point when we talk about not only line of sight with your speakers, a lot of people put center channels in an entertainment center. Or sometimes they put it on top of a shelf in an entertainment center and then they push it all the way back to the wall. And that center channel is just bouncing sound off of the shelf. That kills speech intelligibility right there. That changes the frequency response of the speaker. So if you're going to put a center channel into a cabinet, I would recommend making a flush mount with that cabinet, putting a lot of absorption into that cabinet. So that way it doesn't change the volume that that speaker is playing into. Um, and if you're putting it on a shelf, put it at the edge of the shelf if you can. I know it doesn't look good from a wife acceptance factor, but when you shove that center channel back to the wall, you're getting reflections off that shelf. Also, you're putting that speaker really close to a boundary where it may not have been designed for, which gives you a boost in bass, which will decrease intelligibility. Yeah, as we mentioned, that can cause masking. So if all it does is lower essentially the register of the male voices kind of a thing that in and of itself isn't a problem but there's a lot more sound that comes out of a center channel than just the voices of the actors and so all those other sounds having their low frequencies enhanced is going to cause a masking effect so uh yeah and we've said this before i think on the forums uh, james and i have gotten into this with folks and and i think we've mentioned it in videos but basically putting speakers into cabinets or on top of cabinets can itself be problematic if you don't address those diffraction and reflection issues, which are all going to affect intelligibility and uh, timbre. I mean, it's going to make it sound different than it's supposed to. Right. Well, I think we wrapped it up. Um, guys, I hope you like this video. I will chop up the last 10 minutes or so and make that a shorter video for people to watch that don't want to sit through this hour and 15 minute video. But I think it's important that we do these uh, long live streams, you know, once a week if we can. I just think it's good educational wise. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audioholics. 
I'll be putting the slideshow there. So if you want to go over those talking points that Matt showed you at your leisure, you're welcome to download it there. Matt, thanks for coming back. And uh, it's great to have you back, especially at one o'clock in the morning. And I can't <laughs> believe we're up right now doing this. But that just uh, shows you the dedication of Audioholics. Exactly. And I guarantee you my, my new baby is probably also up at the moment. <laughs> my poor wife is probably dealing with that. So I'll, I'll go help her out in a minute. But, you know, I think we should get folks maybe excited about what's coming, too. So we're going to be doing a video on um, crappy listening tests and why people should maybe avoid those. And we're going to explain in more scientific terms what makes them so bad. And we're going to be doing a multi-part series on bass, everything everybody wants to know about that, which is going to include things like the multi-subwoofer approach, EQ, the benefits of it, the misunderstanding of how it works, and uh, some stuff around just acoustics in general as it pertains to bass. So that's going to be at least two parts. I'm still working on it, so you know we may have to split it up further. But you know that gives us a good uh, probably month or so's worth of content to cover the summer. Awesome. I'm looking forward to all this knowledge that you're going to be dropping. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this. And until next time, my friends, keep listening. <laughs>